such things. So, I just put that on Campus Wire. If you have a moment, please, please, please let us know how, for instance, you thought the midterm went, right? Some other questions that I will use to help make this a better course. I also want to compare how you think you did to how you actually did, right? Sometimes there's some interesting gaps there. So if you can, please give us a little bit of information. Okay. Um, whew, how about it? Like, just as a show of hands, do you think you did the way you wanted to do? Or like, eh, or like, Okay, so there's a distinctly mix with a lot more medium thumbs than anything else and a number of downwards. What surprised you? Did anything jump out at you? Yeah? The length. The, uh, the length, it took longer than I expected. Just to go through it, just the amount of time? Yeah. Okay. So it feel, felt like a time pressure situation, like that was too much question. Okay. Anybody else feel time pressure? Yeah. Okay. A, an interesting side note. Whoops. Another side note is that I almost just lost the microphone. Uh, an interesting side note. Last quarter, this, this midterm, I had somebody walk out at 20 minutes. And then I had a bunch of other people walk out at like 40 minutes. And so I was maybe overcorrecting. That's what I'm sensing from that one. Okay. Um, was there anything that slowed you down particularly? Was it just the amount of questions or was there a question that like socked you for time? The wording for which graph? Oh, oh, awk rock. Okay. Like, you spend a lot of time puzzling out the wording. Ah, okay. Okay. So, like, a graphical version of that question would have been much faster than the word version of that question. Okay. That's a good insight. Thanks. Anything else? Elastic net. Elastic net, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, that question was like write the formula down for elastic net. And what I heard from some people is if you had that written down in the cheat sheet, that was a free mm -hmm. But if you didn't, you were completely screwed. So you didn't think it was possible to write it down from the text description if you didn't have that in your notes? Because that was kind of the intent. It was either halfway to a freebie or it was. If it isn't free because you have it in your notes, it, the idea of that question was, do you understand the words that should, in enough detail, give you the loss function that, such that you could write it down? So did people feel like they could understand those words or no? It's OK if it's no. This is honest attempted at feedback. Yeah? Okay. So the cheat sheet, the, peop, the havers who had it on their cheat sheet clearly had an advantage over those that didn't. And I was overly optimistic that the words could lead you to write down the math. Yeah. I think it depends on how it's graded. How specific to the actual formula. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the, the grading scheme on that is not to be utterly rigid about exactly this form. It's whether or not it's effectively the same. Um, but we'll find out. That one hasn't been graded yet for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there was some confusion between multiple sources on that. So this is absolutely a thing you've put your finger on, that some of the lab section said one page and only one page. And I said in lecture on the Wednesday that we had, I asked people for one page, one side, but I also offhand mentioned that I had had people bring in two pagers last time, and I realized that enforcing that was just a nightmare and that I wasn't going to do it. So I think that that, roughly speaking, caused some people to two-pager it, and especially if you weren't in the lab section that emphasized the one page, you definitely felt that that was okay. Yeah, so there's some confusion there, for sure. Um, okay, well, thanks for highlighting that confusion. We'll make it ultra explicit exactly what we're gonna do on midterm two. And the important part, again, from my standpoint, part of, you've already got the groove now about how these exams go. Uh, I definitely, like, so myself and one of the TAs timed ourselves on this exam where we forced ourselves to read it, right? Not to, like, skip through it knowing that we knew the questions, but, like, to pretend that we were naive in reading it. And then we forced ourselves to very slowly solve it. And our times were, like, 15, 20 minutes. And I knew that, that what that would mean is that if you didn't know if you had to go to a cheat sheet, right? That was gonna double your time without any doubt, right? Just like the act of not being able to write down the answer, but the act of having to reference and look stuff up was gonna double your time to perform the test. And that's where we designed to, right? But um, the idea of a single sheet, cheat sheet, is that you've really reviewed and condensed the material so much you hardly need it anymore. <laughs> right? Um, and that's, that's where I wanted people to get, but I can hear from the time comments and so on and so forth that that didn't quite happen for many or most of you. So, okay. All right, learning experiences all around. Uh, we will obviously get you your grades just as fast as we can. Um, the automatically marked stuff is already done. The hand marked stuff is in progress. Uh, you will get feedback. You will get to ask questions and all that good stuff. Um, and we'll see. I don't know at this moment if there's going to be any curving. I tend not to do it. I will warn you that if I curve, that tends to be a proper curve. It's not I add 10 points to everybody's score. It's I z-score this, and I set the mean and variance where it should be, right? And that, if I curve, that does have the potential to bring the high scorers down as well as the low scorers up, because you know what a z-score does, okay? So I try not to curve. I only curve if it's really obvious that stuff went horribly awry. But if I do curve, those people who got their high scores may be upset with me. OK. Uh, we're going to get back into the swing of things now. Uh, I did not do a pre-video for those of you that are checking that. I am going to release pre-videos from now on again. The, uh, this time, what I want to do is I want to do a bit of catch-up on things we didn't get to talk about in the first half, okay? So just a quick review about where we left model selection to start with. The idea of cross-validation as our 
pretty much default method for doing model selection. We take all the data, we split off a test set, set that test set aside. Everything left is our validation, cross-validation data set, and that gets used for both training and the holdout or validation, right? The mean across the holdouts is used as a score for how good a given model did, and we do this however many models we're gonna check. We do this if there's M models to check, we do that M times. And we talked about what are those models? Right? Those models are different hyperparameter settings. Now, something that came up while people were asking me questions during exam review that I probably didn't emphasize enough in class the last time around. When we choose a different hyperparameter, like K on K nearest neighbors, or regularization strength, what we're doing is we are changing the way the model works. Given a fixed training set, the model is going to get a different set of parameters, right? Choose your hyperparameter, fix your training data, you're going to get a different set of weight vectors or parameters for every hyperparameter setting. The hyperparameters affect how the model learns. Does this make sense? Because there were definitely some confusion points that I was asked questions on during the lead up to the exam. The idea of model selection is choose the right hyperparameters to get a set of parameters to get the best answers on the data. Right? OK, once we've got our best answers, we train up on all of this cross-validation set. Why? Because that gives us the most data to set up our best possible weights. We've picked our best possible hyperparameters. They're fixed by the doing this m times for m models with m different hyperparameter settings. We train up with all of this data that we've used so far. We make our best possible weights given those hyperparameter settings, and we test on the test set. Is everybody clear on that? Does anybody want to ask a question or a clarification here? Because we're going to make life more complicated. OK. So if we're all clear on this, let's cover nested cross-validation finally. So nested cross-validation can be used. It's a, it's a hammer, and it can be used for multiple different projects, right? Nested cross-validation was invented with the idea of algorithm selection in mind. Algorithm selection. The idea that what we're going to do is we're going to check logistic regression versus k-nearest neighbors versus decision tree. We're going to ask ourselves, which algorithm is the best algorithm for this kind of problem? Each one of those three algorithms has a ton of different hyperparameter settings. So what we're asking is the question, pick the best hyperparameter settings for k-nearest neighbors. Pick the best hyperparameter settings for logistic regression. Compare those two against each other, head to head, high score versus high score. OK? That's algorithm comparison. So that's what nested cross validation is really set up to do. But we can, because it's a tool, we can use it in different ways. It doesn't have to do that. OK? But that's what we're set up for. Let's look at why it's set up that way. So the idea of nested cross-validation is that we cross-validate. We have a holdout set. right? This is the big, dark, and light stuff over here. So this is cross-validation one. Here's our holdout. Here's cross-validation two. There's our holdout. And cross-validation split three. Okay. Within each cross-validation, we run another cross-validation. That's why it's called nested. OK? So the idea is this 
outer holdout. This is a validation set for comparing algorithms. Okay? This inner, this is another cross-validation run on what had been, quote, the training set, right? We cross-validate in here. We do this loop however many hyperparameters times we're going to do this. So if we have 20 hyperparameters for k-nearest neighbors, we do that inner loop 20 times. And then if we have 20 hyperparameters for logistic <coughs> regression, we do it another 20 times. Okay. So we've done that inner loop 40 times now. Out of the 20 logistic regressions, we pick the best inner performance level, performance on the inner nested loop. That's our model, baby. Train it on the entire chunk of dark green here. Get it ready predict on this holdout. For our 20 K nearest neighbors in here, we pick the best out of the 20, train it on all this stuff, test it on that holdout. Okay. What do you think is going to happen between the different splits on the outer loop? Will we get the same best hyperparameter? People have not quite wrap, wrapped their minds around this yet, and that's understandable. This is complicated. Okay. So we do this 20 plus 20 times, right? Pick the best for each algo. Train the best there. And then, well, I shouldn't say test. I should say validation performance. But we're going to do this again, right? We're going to do it here. And we're going to do it here with different versions of the training and holdout data. This data is not the same as that data. So we're going to get different answers for sure, right? It is entirely possible that the best uh, hyperparameters for a k-nearest neighbor on this is totally different than the best hyperparameters for k-nearest neighbors here. That is possible. You can't predict. That's why this is for algorithm selection, right? This is not pick the best model. It can't be because you're going to get different best models here and here and here, very likely. So it's not about pick the best model. It's about, given that we're picking the best model, which algorithm keeps outperforming the other one on these holdout sets out here, right? I can't tell from your faces if this is boring you or not clicking. So which way is it? <laughs> what are the questions? Yeah. Sure. I mean, so we can do the same trick with a, what's called like a flat way to do it with any of these algorithms, right? I can run train test split. I can run regular old cross validation, but those are flat in the sense that I train every single one of those models for each of the algorithms. And then I'm comparing their performance say, on average, on the validation set. 
or on average across this holdout splits of a flat cross validation. Okay? So however many times I've done this, those are just, I'm taking the average performance. But this nested method on these inner bits is picking the best hyperparameter here and a separate, possibly separate, different best hyperparameter there. And so what we're doing is, is we're seeing performance of the algorithm not based on the best hyperparameters on the whole training set, but based on the best hyperparameters in each one of these inners, which allows us to sample, because this is a resampling procedure, right? It allows us to get a better view of how this is going to go down in the real world, because we're, we're not overfitting to our training set, right? We're shuffling that training set up. So this kind of a procedure, because of the double resample, because of the inner and the outer cross-validation, we're messing with the data more. That means we're less overfit to our training set. But it, you have to be aware of what you're testing. You're testing algorithm one versus algorithm two. Okay? Not particular hyperparameter settings, just best version of algo one versus best version of algo two. Does that make sense-ish? So if you, what you want to do is algorithm comparison, not model selection, this is a standard way to work. It's super efficient. It's really good at preventing overfitting because of the double resampling. Right? So, great question. So here on this outer right here, yes, you could have k-nearest neighbors beat logistic regression, and then you could have the opposite here. Yes. But the average across these outers, that's the algorithm that does best, right? So there comes a single answer at the end. Okay, I don't want to belabor the point because that's really what nested is meant for, is comparing algorithms. But you can use it for model comparison. You can use it for model selection. You got to do it a little differently. So for algorithm selection, right, we still may need to split off a test set for later if you want a test estimation because in algorithm selection, this outer is just it's a second validation set, right? It's not a test set, it's a validation set. Okay? If you're gonna do model selection with this, we don't split off a test set. So this is 3B, this may look like the last one, but it's a different slide, okay? Algorithm selection version, model selection version. Okay, when we use it for model selection, what we're doing is we're using that outer CV as a test set, okay? So we're not, we're gonna, in this case what we're doing to give you the picture is we're gonna use all these inners as like one big lumped way to select the best model, right? It's a flat view of all these inners. It's just a double resampling model selection in that case. We lump all these together, we pick the best performer as our model, and then we can evaluate that model on the outers as a test set. If this is a little confusing to you, don't worry, because it's, like I said, it's like trying to use a hammer for a different reason, okay? It is a little weird, but you just reconceptualize these as one big flat cross-validation. All these inners just become one big cross-validation. We pick our best model, we evaluate our model on, these, on the outer loops holdouts, and that becomes a test. OK? 
Okay. I'm not going to write any questions on this, by the way. <laughs> I just want you to know this is used. Yeah. So the outer side, so we, we pick the best model among these, right? And then we need data it wasn't trained on to evaluate it as a test set. So this holdout, it wasn't trained on, right? right. So whatever we trained up here, we evaluate here. Whatever we trained up here, we evaluate here. Whatever we trained up here, we evaluate there. No, this, there's an outer cross-validation loop and an inner cross-validation loop. Yeah. OK. Again, nested cross-validation, why it exists is because it's super efficient with the data points, right? It's by double resampling, we are using small amounts of data to their maximum that we can get out of them. It is usually used as an algorithm comparison method because that's where it's most efficient, both in terms of time and memory and how, what you got to store where. Okay. So if you got a couple thousand samples and a hard problem and you want to do some algorithm comparison, this would be the way to do it. If you've got two trillion internet cat videos, you're never going to do this, right? Like, this is a lot of training. And if these are two trillion cat videos, there's no way you have the comp computational resources to do this. So in many ways, nested cross-validation is something which, in the deep learning era, we're not seeing very often, OK? But I want you to at least kind of have this in the back of your head. Because if you need it, you're going to have to figure it out yourself, <laughs> right? Like I said, I'm not going to ask you any detailed questions on nested cross-validation. But I need you to know there exists this more efficient way if you need to self-educate. OK, so let's start a new topic real quick. Everybody remembers this, right? It was even on the test. Why is there a negative sign there? So who, can, who can answer me that question? Why is this negative? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you were, you were the first. We want to go down the gradient, but the gradient is like by the upward trend. Uh-huh. Exactly. So the uh, partial derivative is the tangent line, right? But these are vectors. So vectors got to have direction. By convention, gradients always point upwards. So to move towards the minima where we want to go, we need to go negative the gradient. OK? Super important. OK, gradient descent, we've already seen this as a concept. What you may not have realized is that this is not like the answer to the problem. This is an approximation to the answer. That doesn't quite click for a lot of people. Gradient descent is a way to take a little bit of a step in the direction of the gradient so that we go that way and end up here next. When starting at this location, we go to that location, and then that one, and then that one, and maybe like that. Right? That's our ideal. It's an iterative attempt at finding the solution, and it's an approximation of the solution. Yeah? Um, we've gone over algorithms like k of n, where it gets 
getting way worse as the dimensionality increases. Does yep. gradient descent have anything like that, or the more variables you have, the way worse it gets? Not in the most direct way. So, does it, in general, the more parameters we're talking about, yes, the harder it is. Why is that? Because this is a one-dimensional view, and most problems that are high dimensionality, like each dimension might contribute something like that. So if you can imagine two dimensions that both look like that, orthogonal to each other, right? You can construct a 3D image in your head, right? Of some relatively complicated lost surface. If you just imagine this thing right here rotated like that through the plane of the projection at you, right? You can imagine this funky shaped bowl at a third dimension. I know you're, it's really hard to imagine a four dimensional lost surface, but that's what I'm asking you to do, okay? The more dimensions you add, just assuming like a kind of a constant complexity on the shape of the loss for each individual thing, you can understand that more dimensions equals a harder loss surface to find a really good minima in, right? So it's an indirect kind of thing. All right. So, we have been talking about what's called batch gradient descent without ever labeling it batch. The idea is this, you take the entire training set, you calculate the gradient on that entire design matrix X, and you step on it, right? That's this picture that we've been looking at over and over and over again. Whatever my entire training set is, I calculate the gradient on that whole data set at once. So when we're talking about two trillion cat videos on YouTube as our training set, this becomes impossible. You can't hold all two trillion cat videos in memory on any machine in existence. You can't do it. You cannot calculate the gradient for the entire data set at once. So there is a version called stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic, as always, means random. What we do is, out of the two trillion cat videos, we pick one at random. We load it into memory. We calculate the gradient on that one random cat video. We take a step in the proper direction. We pick another random video. We do it again. Okay? That's what this notation is, this sub i. Whoops, I didn't want to draw, I just wanted to highlight. Right, we pick x sub i, we pick y sub i. We calculate the gradient on this random i th thingy. Okay. No memory, well, I mean just enough memory to hold one video required. You can do this on your laptop. Now, we're in a case where what we're doing is an approximation of an approximation. Calculating the gradient is an approximation to the solution. It takes us a step in the right way. Calculating the gradient on one data point at a time, well, it matters which data point we pick in what order. So if you have a complicated loss surface like this, I'm gonna to try to draw something, um, and we pick a data point that makes, you know, the, like we pick one data point and it's loss right here at this parameter setting, W, is like this. So we get that tangent and we take a step going that way, right? So we move to our next data point here, okay? But if we picked a different data point, the lost surface might have looked like this. Right? I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to draw something, but I'm drawing it poorly, sorry. <laughs> I apologize for my terrible artwork. Okay, let me do something 
more extreme. Right? So some other data point, I star, and for data point I, right, we get two different loss surfaces because of the different data point we selected. So we're going to move in different directions from here. Right? That's the stochastic nature. Now, on average, we're going to converge towards the same path, but especially when these lost surfaces are really wiggly, we're going to get potentially very different answers depending upon the order of data points coming through. Okay? Does this make sense to people? Batch all of the data, one data point at a time, stochastic. And when we're stochastic, order matters, and order is random. So we, we could do the same problem multiple times and get completely different weight vectors at the end of it. OK? All right. So of course, there's something in the middle. This is called mini-batch. What we do is we pick a chunk of training data, not one cat video, but say 100 cat videos. And we train on chunks of data in random stochastic order. We've got the same things as before with stochastic gradient descent because order matters. So which chunks we pick in what order are going to change our solution. We have you know, more memory usage, because we got a chunk of data instead of one data point. Probably got less variability in the batch situation than we have in the stochastic, because there's fewer permutations, at least, of things that could happen in terms of order. This is where modern machine learning usually lies, is in the mini-batch world. Most deep learning algorithms trained with mini-batch gradient descent. Because most deep learning problems are too big for batch. And stochastic gradient descent, it's just not state of the art. It's certainly possibly more variable answer, given the randomness. And it certainly is not the most efficient way to transform your data into a solution. So this is where fast modern algorithms live, is mini-batch. Questions, worries, thoughts? OK. So let's make it harder. <laughs> Remember that the gradient descent is an approximation to a solution. So I'm lazy. I just screenshot Wikipedia. This is an optimization problem, right? And if you're doing optimization and you're just following the gradient, I. I just take a moment and understand how this kind of a graph works. God, ugh. highlighter. OK. These lines, who here is a hiker and knows how to read a topo map? Yeah? Tell us how to read a topo map. Yeah, so, so each line is constant altitude, right? So this is like the same altitude. And this is one step lower in altitude. And down here is assumedly the bottom of the valley, right? And this is the top of the ridge line. What happens when our topo lines are close together? Sorry, sorry. It's steep, right? When the topo lines are far apart, it's a nice slope. When the topo lines are close together, it's a cliff. Right? So gradient descent goes down the gradient. Right? If you're right here, your very first gradient is going to be perpendicular to these contour lines. Going perpendicular to the contour lines is straight down. That green path is gradient descent. Right? It's sending you down the cliff. And then once you're inside the valley, there is still a gradient going further towards one part of the valley. That's going this way. Right? This is the, the steep stuff. These are the cliffs. 
but then inside the valley there is a more gentle rundown over here. So that's gradient descent, right? It takes a long path. But if instead of just using the first derivative, if we calculate the second derivative or even higher order derivatives, you can figure out shortcuts when they exist, right? If they exist depends upon the loss surface. The shape of the loss surface, that's defined by your data, right? So if shortcuts exist, like we see in this diagram, using a higher order, second order of derivative, mixing in a little bit of the second order and not just the first derivative, that can help you get to the solution more efficiently. Okay? These are the so-called higher order terms. We're going to update our function to be function of the first derivative plus some of the second derivative. Broadly speaking, these are called Newton's methods. So, so the quasi-Newton method is the one where we calculate this matrix called the Hessian, which is the second order. Sorry, I don't mean to flip off any Europeans. Uh, the second order, the second derivative matrix. Now, calculating that matrix is in general a very computationally intense thing, okay? So the Newton methods are, hey, let's use the exact Hessian matrix, okay? Let's calculate the second derivative. Computationally hard. The quasi-Newton methods are, eh, we're already doing an approximation anyway. Gradient descent is not an exact answer. So let's just approximate the second derivative, make an approximation of an approximation, okay? So quasi-Newton methods are faster because we're not exactly calculating the second derivative, but we're still getting an increase in how fast we can get to the answer, right? This is not an optimization class. As I, as I showed you in the beginning, like we one or week two, optimization classes are an entire quarter or maybe two all on their own. It's when you're really going to dig into this math, okay? If you become a machine learning engineer where you're like, hey, I'm setting up the computational pipeline so that people can do machine learning, you're going to need to know this math, right? You're going to be all about these kinds of implementation details. If you are a machine learning user, I guess, or <laughs> yeah, data scientist, right? Where what you're doing is, is you're using somebody's machine learning pipeline to get some answers. I still need you to understand why there are so many freaking solutions that you can choose among when you are trying to get a machine learning system to work. There are different solvers for every single one of these scikit-learn algorithms. If you look in logistic regression, I believe there are four different solvers that can be used for logistic regression. What's the difference between them? Are they first order methods? Just pure gradient descent? Are they second order methods? Are they exact second order or approximate second order so they're faster to solve? The standard logistic regression method is limited memory Broyden Fletcher Goldfarb Shano algorithm. Yes, I just had to read that. No way I'm remembering that. Right? What is it? It's a quasi Newton method. So it has that second derivative in it. But it just approximates that second order derivative by keeping kind of an updating time window of the second derivative, approximating just a few sparse elements of the big vector space over time to understand that second derivative. If you care, or if you're going to take an optimization class, you'll be able to study on your own or in a class what this actually means. But important part, it's an approximation of gradient descent on the second order. It is fast. 
it is because of this limited memory requirement, it's particularly good for a large number of variable problems, right? So if you're using logistic regression on a data set, picking different solvers can give you different answers, right? You can end up with a different weight vector by picking a different solver. You can certainly end up in a situation where it takes longer or shorter time to get your answer. Okay. Um, so I highly recommend looking through the scikit-learn docs and learning a little bit about um, these different solvers. Okay. So one higher order term that we've just talked about is the second derivative during gradient descent. Another thing is to add in momentum. As, remember the whole picture? This is another different, totally different higher order term, okay? Remember the picture of balls rolling down a hill? Well, regular gradient descent is, as if you have a physics model in your head, it's as if those balls have no mass, right? If you instantly, if you're going this direction and then suddenly the gradient is no longer going this way but it's suddenly going that way, you just instantly switch, right? It's massless. There's no momentum in the solution. Even if you've been stepping this way, suddenly if you step that way because of the gradient change, you're just gonna do that. But you can add in momentum to a solution. So if I have no momentum, so this is, um, this is a little live thing. Distill is a web publication about machine learning. That's actually pretty fun. You should check it out on your own. The link to this is in the PDFs. Let's take a look at this lost surface. It's that valley situation, right? So it's steep valley going this way. This is like a Grand Canyon. And then like inside the Grand Canyon, there is a gradient inside the canyon, right? Just like the Colorado River inside the Grand Canyon flows from west to east, because there's a gradient inside the canyon as well, right? So you have a Grand Canyon here. If you start up here on the overlook and you take plain old gradient descent, then you ring back and forth across the canyon from this overlook to the opposite side, oops, too far, back over here, back over here, back over here. If your step size is bigger, that ringing gets worse, right? You're just taking steps that are too big and it's taking a long time to converge, okay? Well. What if instead of letting our gradient descent be massless, what if we add mass to it? So that if we start rolling down the hill in one direction, even if the gradient direction switches on the next time step, we still want to kind of continue on in the direction we went because we have physical mass and momentum, okay? So if we dial up momentum, what we can see is a bunch of things happen. First off, we do tend um, over here to potentially shoot a little bit further up the hill the wrong way, right? That's just the nature of momentum. If I add in loads of momentum, actually it doesn't really change much, does it? Okay. But once we are down in the flats, especially once we have descended into the canyon, that's where momentum really helps us out. Okay? When stuff is steep, momentum is, if anything, hurting us, right? It can definitely mess with us if we have too much momentum. But without momentum, we just never even get to the optimum because the gradient out here is so flat, right? It's hard to step. This gradient is very close to zero. Our step size is very close to zero. We're taking tiny little baby steps, and we hit some convergence criteria and we stop. Whereas adding momentum really helps us with the flats, you know, get to the actual optimum. And obviously too much momentum, right? 
It's a problem. Okay? Just like too big a step size is a problem. But for any given thing in here, there is some optimum. Okay? All right. So momentum is one way to add a higher order term. I'm not, before you run away, I'm not going to go into it, but I want you to note that in the things, there's another interactive thing to go look at about changing that step size lambda on the fly. So you should read that on your own. Adaptive step sizes are another higher order term. So three higher order terms. Second order derivative, momentum, and adaptive step sizes. They can all be parts of these solvers. Have fun, everybody. See you for support vector machines on Wednesday. Super fun. Oh, A5, yes. Um, there was a massive cock up in the lead up to the, uh, the, the exam. A5 did not get released. It is supposed to be released today if the TAs actually manage that. And then it will be due on next weekend. So you're going to have five days. It's also going to be a short uh, assignment. Okay? Thank you.